All right. Welcome everybody to Finance Essentials with Danny Hudson. I am your host, Danny Hudson, and we have a spectacular surprise this week. Um, I have a special guest with me. Um, a lot of you may recognize him, especially whenever we go over his, uh, his, uh, his resume and what he's done over the years. Um, but if not, you guys are, are especially in for a treat. And I would recommend following him uh, on uh, Facebook if for no other reason than the fact that he posts awesome pictures and videos all the time. Um, but with me today is Billy Lane. Um, he is the owner and founder and I think at this point, basically sole creator, right, of, of Choppers Inc. It's, it's a one man, one man shop at this point, right? Right, correct. Perfect. And uh, so you guys may be aware of Billy. He was on, the, the big one was probably the Great Biker Build-Off, which was in the early 2000s. Uh, but he also made guest appearances on Monster Garage, American Biker, Night Calls, Blood, Sweat, and Gears. Um, and he has also written a couple of books. Um, one of them was Chop Fiction. It's not a motorcycle, baby. It's a chopper. And Billy Lane's How to Build Old School Choppers. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about some of that stuff today. But, uh, but Billy, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm, I'm doing fantastic. I'm really glad that we were able to take some time. I know you're probably one of the busiest people that I know. So the, the fact that I was able to, to squeeze in a little bit of time makes me feel, uh, makes me feel pretty special. No, I'm, I'm glad to do it. You know, I mean, um, I'm busy because, you know, what I do, nobody needs it. Nobody on the planet needs my services. That's one of the worst professions to be in. I'm really <laughs> blessed. Right. <laughs> so so whenever they go, whenever they talk about essential services, you're like, well, I know who that's not. Yeah, that's not me. But I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have been doing it over 30 years and I'm still here. So I stay busy because I have to be busy to, to support myself, you know, otherwise yeah. I have to do a job I don't love. Yeah, absolutely. And, and now, especially with, with three little girls, you know, it's not even just you, you got, uh, now you have to think long-term, right? You got to think long-term planning. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had kids late in life um, and the biggest blessings in my life, the three of them. And, but um you know, it's, it's a big responsibility. And I, I, you know, not only do I want to make sure I can take care of them financially for the next 20 plus years, but I want to physically, personally, make sure that I'm available to them too, because I started so late in life. Sure. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and speaking as far as starting that late in life, um, you know, what about the, what about the motorcycle part of it? My guess is, is that I, I just picture you being like a four or five year old kid working on your bike in the garage, that kind of thing. Is, is that kind of where, where a lot of this started? Yeah. You know, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida and um, born in 1970. Uh, so, you know, Easy Rider, the movie came out in 1969 um, and all those biker movies that followed that, you know, in the, all through the seventies, it was kind of a big deal. And uh, on any Sunday came out, I've never seen the Bruce Brown movie on any Sunday with Steve McQueen you know, it was, it was a big deal um, in the 70s. Motorcycling was kind of really having a, I guess it's, I wouldn't say it's heyday, but it was um, a rebirth almost. Um, and so I wanted to do that. I saw it all over Miami and, you know, everywhere my mom would take me, my brother to the doctor to practice for sports or to school. And we'd see motorcycles everywhere. And I really, really wanted one. And we were riding bicycles and, you know, we'd cut the forks on our bicycles and stack other sets of forks together and make long chopper bicycles. I mean, you know, we were, we were little kids thinking we were in the movie Easy Rider. That's hilarious. And I'm assuming too, you guys probably had at that point probably would have been called like a biker gang, right? Cause if you and your friends yeah. all had, you know, their bikes and stuff. Um, and, and I'm assuming the parents were cool. Cause I feel like if I was a kid and I did that with my bike, my parents would be like, do you know how much money we spent on that bike and you're messing it up? <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I don't know what the average age group or your viewer is, but in the seventies, there was no video games. There was no right. Nintendo. Right, you know, your right. parents would say, go outside and play yep. and come home when it gets dark. Yeah. And that's what we did. And we would have go out on our bicycles and ride around and, you know, we chop our boat bicycles and our friends' garages or our garages or under our carports or whatever it was. And that was how we lived. I mean, you know, we'd go out and and do outdoor physical activities. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember being a kid and, and I still tell people this and, you know, we laugh about it, um, you know, but it wasn't uncommon to literally be locked out of the, of the house. <laughs> they would tell us to go outside and they would literally lock the door. And yeah. unless something was broken or you were bleeding 
or something like that. You, I mean, you literally were not allowed back inside. <laughs> yeah, you needed a drink of water. You drank it from the hose. Right. You know exactly. I mean? exactly. <laughs> now we, now I see like, you know, Oliver drinking from the hose and we're like, what are you doing? Don't yeah. do that. We have a bottle of water for you right over here. <laughs> that, that water's not from France. You can't yeah. drink. That. Yeah, exactly. That's not, <laughs> that's not glacier fed water. I mean, come on, that can't be healthy for you. Well, that's yeah. great. Well, um, so then with, with the bicycles and everything like that, whenever you were a kid, um, what was your first introduction then into, into actual working on motorcycles? I mean, um, so my, uh, I told you I was from Miami and in the late eighties and early nineties, South beach, Miami had a big renaissance. Like that was a really rundown area. It had been built, uh, in the twenties, uh, and thirties, you know, kind of art deco, all the all the architecture on on South Beach, Miami is Art Deco, and those hotels and um, all the buildings there have been really run down. In the late eighties, it started to have a renaissance, and all these European tourists started coming to South Beach and vacationing there in the winter time, and they were buying Corvettes and muscle cars and Harley Davidsons to ship back to Europe. And we happened to be there at that time, and my brother and my dad were working on. Corvettes mostly. And I worked with them. We started actually working on Corvettes and doing stuff on cars. And then a lot of these uh, people we were dealing with started saying, Hey, can you do some stuff on a Harley Davidson for me? I want to send it back to Belgium or France or whatever country they were from. And so we started working on Harleys and I just became really interested in and hooked on them. Yeah. And so that's actually different than going the Corvette route. So was there anything kind of, I, I know you talked about being a kid with your bicycle and that kind of thing. So was it kind of that childhood that drew you more towards the motorcycle side of it, as opposed to going kind of the hot rod, you know, car route. Yeah. I mean, I, I loved cars too, and I still love cars, but I mean, the, I just think the, um, as a kid seeing all these like outlaw motorcycle club guys riding around on choppers around Miami, when we were being our car going places. And then, um, we had a few friends growing up that had older brothers that had motorcycles and, I just was always intrigued by that. And then, um, you know, I've always been into music and I really wanted to be a musician was really what I wanted to do. Uh, and we would, when we started working on the motorcycles in South beach in the late eighties and early nineties, there's a lot of great rock and roll clubs that would be have 25 Harley Davidson choppers parked out front people coming to see all these rock shows. And so, you know, I just think that really drew me in and compelled me and was what, kind of formed who I am, you know, I mean, it formed who I, I for my identity. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. That's, that's awesome. And so I'm assuming then that's probably around the time that you got your first motorcycle then, right? You probably got your first one. Did you, what was that one? And, and did you also do the same thing with that? Like you did your bike where you're like, I'm just going to buy this and then I'm going to change it all up and, and, yeah. and make it my own. Yeah. So the interesting little side note to that whole thing was my parents were scared to death of motorcycles. Of course. Paid, even though we were working on them for baby and my brother to have motorcycles. Right. My older brother bought a Harley Davidson chopper probably in 1986 or 87. And I wanted one and my parents were like, absolutely not. And I went away to college. I went to Florida state in 1988 and they told me no motorcycles, no way. And I'd already been working. I started working when I was 11 or 12. So I had money, you know, I already, I've been saving money and, um, and I've actually bought an expensive guitar cause I want to be a musician, but then I got into the motorcycle thing. And anyhow, uh, so as soon as I went away to college, my parents weren't looking and I was working right. and, and making money. And so I, I, I bought a Harley Davidson 1950 Harley Davidson panhead. Um, it was in, in pieces. It was all I could afford. I was a college kid. Yeah. And so, um, and I started putting it together and that was my first motorcycle. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and of course too, I think that story is very closely aligned with a lot of people say where they, where they were like, well, my parents said, don't do this. Or my parents said, don't have that. And then all you can think of is, is, well, now I have to right yeah. like now, now that's what I have to do yeah. and so if and so you bought it in pieces how was it when you put it together because I think at that point in time you had had years of motorcycle experience kind of fixing them up and, and that kind of thing I mean did it did it fire right up like I mean <clears throat> it, was, it was ready to roll as soon as you put it together pretty much yeah I mean I, I <clears throat> excuse me I um you know I had a few issues with it but I learned a lot like that first bike 
taught me. I'd already been working on them. So I had experience, but that bike, I learned so much work that I made a lot of mistakes. And through those mistakes, I learned what not to do and more importantly, what to do. And, um, and, you know, I was riding it one day and that's how I met my first paying customer. I was riding it. This guy was broke down on the side of the road. He had an almost identical machine to mine and I stopped and helped him. He ended up being an ultra wealthy kid from a very wealthy family. And he was my first paying customer. I was waiting tables to put myself through college because my parents were paying for my college until they found that at Harley Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> Once they found that out. Right. Right. Well, Hey, I bet you at least have covered it up for a little while, right? Yeah. You're, you're on your own kid. <laughs> and so I was on my own. I started waiting tables and, um, and I met this guy who was broke down. I fixed his bike for him. We became friends. I started doing other work for him, some mechanical work. And I realized I can make more, working on his bike before lunchtime that can wait, making a whole week of night shifts, waiting tables. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, I kind of started doing that for people and that's really how I got into this. And so that, that actually kind of leads me to where I was wanting to go next is, is that as, as long as I've known you and, and, and researching you and, and that kind of thing, it's, it's almost seemed like you've always done your own thing. Um, have you ever actually ventured out, um, and was actually working for somebody else, even if it was, a, if it was, a, a another, um, motorcycle shop or anything like that, or have you pretty much done your own thing since the beginning? For a brief period, when I was in Miami, before I, I moved out of Miami, I worked for a guy and he did mostly British motorcycles like Triumphs, Norton's, BSAs, Vincent's. And he also did Jaguars and Ferraris. And I worked for him for about two years and I learned a ton because they're so different than American than Harley Davidson's. And then especially working on the Ferraris. And this is, again, back in the, you know, um, early 90s, mid 90s. And everything for the Ferraris was on a microfilm, you know, before you could pick up a Google or look anything up on, on a laptop. So I was reading my Yeah. And so I did that for a couple of years. And I learned that. And that was also a good learning experience. I learned a lot about vehicles I didn't know anything about. But I also learned that I didn't really want to work for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I came back to, to doing what I do. Yeah. You know, there's, it's funny because a lot of the people that, that share that very similar mentality, um, there, there tends to be a, a common thread there is, is that um, a lot of times they're usually like, well, I'm not a, gr- I'm not a great employee. You know, <laughs> not a lot of people would really like to employ me. So I do much better when I'm by myself. Um, I can control myself. I can control everything. And it sounds like it's probably similar to that where, where you wanted to kind of choose your own destiny, which probably would have made it tough for somebody else to employ you because you would have been like, no, 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 no. This is how, this is how I think we should do things. This is how I think, you know, that it should go. And it, and it makes sense to, to kind of go on. And, and even beyond that, working on choppers where you're literally just looking at a blank canvas, right? You're not even, it's not like Legos where you have instructional guides to put it together. You're literally working with a blank slate, um, Mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is, you know, takes it even to the next level. Um, And so, you know, it sounded like when you were in college, you were uh, working on motorcycles and you were fixing them up and, and that kind of thing. At what point did you get to where you were like, well, I'm, I don't want to want to work on these as much. I want to start, building these from scratch and, and, and making my own vision of, of, of what I want them to look like. So and it was all, that was, that point was like a really critical point for me because it was all related to me being in college. So um, I'd met a guy who I also worked on his motorcycle while I was in college and he was graduating. He's a couple years older than me. And he was riding out to Sturgis, South Dakota, which is a big motorcycle rally they have every August. Well, it's the beginning of August, which is always when school starts. So I could never go while I was in college because if I went, I'd miss my first week of classes and it would drop you from the classes. So um, I really wanted to go to Sturgis and, and I was still in school. So I started thinking, okay, how do I get to where I can be gone for a week or two, you know, ride out, for three or four days, be there for a week and then ride back three or four days. And so I decided, well, I'm going to start manufacturing parts because 
already the bike I had, I, I couldn't afford anything. I was just barely, you know, getting by in college and doing my thing. So sure. I started making all the parts that I wanted for my motorcycle because I couldn't afford to buy what I wanted. Um, and in the late eighties and early nineties, there was a, a pretty big boom on custom Harleys. It was, a, it was a big deal and the parts industry was very strong and it was expensive and I just, I couldn't afford it. So I started making everything and I said, well, if I'm making everything for me, why don't I make things for other people? People saw what I was doing and liked it and would ask me to make parts for them. And that's really how my parts business began. And I realized that um, it was, I was making, working on motorcycles made more, more money than waiting tables and then making motorcycle parts made more money than working on motorcycles. And I could make more money by working less, which gave me more time to do, to do the things I wanted to do. And, uh, and is that also around the time? Cause I believe you, you went to FIU and finished up your degree in mechanical engineering. Um, was the thought process there is, is to really kind of understand the engineering aspect behind it. Cause it sounds like you were already doing it at the time. Um, was the part there to, to, to the point there to kind of expand your engineering knowledge to, to be able to, to grow your business in the future? No, cause I was already doing the engineering at Florida state and I really wanted to graduate from there. I was almost done. Moving to Miami was harder scholastically, but my brother was, had called me and said, Hey man, he said, I'm doing really great with my business. I'm so busy that I need more help. Gotcha. And I want you, I want you to be my help. You're so good at what you do. And I learned a lot. He had taught me a lot. So, um, I really moved to Miami to work with him. Um, I, I wanted to stay in Tallahassee and finish at Florida state, but it was, and you know, and he offered me a paycheck and, um, a lot of opportunity that I wouldn't have had. And so I was happy to go back there and, and do it. And we did well, you know, we did really, really well all through the mid nineties. Gotcha. And then, and then um, it sounds like too, as far as the boom that you were describing kind of back in the seventies, as far as motorcycles go, um, I think most people my age, you know, mid late thirties, that kind of thing. We remember you know, I feel like there was another boom, another resurgence in the early 2000s, right. um, which obviously you were very influential when it when it came to that. Um, how did how did that come about? Because I know you being at the forefront and obviously with with biker build off, there were a lot of other, um, you know, very uh, similarly, you know, um, intelligent guys who were just putting together amazing choppers. Um, that were really kind of at the forefront. So how did, how did that kind of play about? Yeah. My, you know, my story is a, mostly a story of timing, but also of ambition. You know I mean? The timing being born in 1970, I was a little bit too young to have been a computer guru, for example, you know, those guys like Steve jobs, those guys were just a few couple years older than me when the like Tandy personal computer came out, you know, when the personal computer came out in the seventies. So I was a little too young to be in that, but my timing was perfect for motorcycling. So by the time the, you know, the nineties started to roll through, um, the, I think the biggest opportunity for me was Jesse James from West coast choppers in long beach, California did, uh, a TV show for discovery channel called, um, motorcycle mania. And I think that came out in 1998. And so I graduated college in 95 really got serious about my parts business in 96. I've been doing it all along, but I was just kind of, you know, I was making beer money and having fun and never really thought that it would go anywhere because back then that it wasn't really a trajectory that you, you know, most guys could even aspire to. Sure. So then all of a sudden Jesse did motorcycle mania and Jesse and I were the same age, had kind of a very similar career paths up to that point got to know each other. He was buying my parts and I was buying his parts. So, um, you know, and the motorcycle industry is a pretty small industry compared to other industries like cars and boats and, and, you know, aircraft. So we knew a lot of the same people and I was selling them my stuff and we developed a relationship. And so, uh, he did, I think motorcycle mania one in 98, I think he did a second one in 99 or 2000. And by the time 2001 rolled around, he was getting ready to do, well, it was still two things. No, it was 2001. He, I saw him in Daytona Beach Bike Week and he asked me to do a show he was getting ready to start called Monster Garage. And I wasn't really that into it, but I saw the opportunity and I saw what Motorcycle Mania had done for Jesse's career. 
And I said, well, I'm going to give that a shot. Sure. And that's kind of um, the leap of faith that I took. Yeah, no, that's great. So, so at that point, um, I know you mentioned as far as buying parts and, and stuff like that. Um, was it officially Choppers Inc. at that time? I mean, so you did have the company. Um, what kind of name recognition did you, did you really have? I know you said it's relatively small circles, but um, if you went to Sturgis or Bike Week, uh, were, you, were you pretty well known at that point? Would you be able to, to walk around and people would recognize you and get pictures and things? Yeah, you know, I was in my mid to late 20s. Um, so you mentioned me being an author. Well, before I wrote those books, I, so I, you know, this is pre-internet now again. Think about that. Sure. Um, if, if you had any recognition in the bike world, it was through being in a motorcycle magazine, like Easy Riders, Hot Bike, um, you know, American Iron. There were several mag good publications out there, Cycle World um, magazine. And so if you weren't in California where those magazines were published most of the time or at one of their events, you weren't going to be in the magazine because they weren't going to spend the money to come to you. So I started going to their, traveling to their shows and doing their shows and made a name for myself there. I did pretty well. And, um, and then I started offering, hey, I can write. I can do technical stuff. Why don't you let me write for you to all the magazines? And they all said, yeah, we'd love to have you. Submit what you have. And if it's good, we'll do it. So I learned how to take pictures with a camera that you had to develop the film. And, <laughs> right, you know. right. So, did you, did you self-develop your photos and everything like that too? No, I, I didn't go that far. Oh, okay. Know? I was I, like, cause you're, you're a very hands-on kind of guy. And so I could totally see you having a, a photo studio because you were like, well, the photos they were making were crap. And so I just decided to do it myself. <laughs> so, you know, I, I did that. And then I, I, I would go write the article and send it to them and on a word processor, you know, before, I mean, it was, you know, or a 386 or a 486 computer. This is how far back we're going. And, um, you know, and, and then eventually got a digital camera and, and it made it a little easier. And, and that's how I, so I had very good re name recognition. And then a lot of times I would trade out stuff with the magazine and say, hey, instead of paying me for my article, because I had done it for free anyway, just to get my name out there. Sure. But hey, can you give me a quarter page ad in your magazine for my parts? And I would naturally promote the parts I was making. You know, I, I learned how to, how to product place my, my product into the article. Right. So promote that way. And, you know, it was all born out of necessity and, um, and it worked, you know, it really worked. I mean, it got me on the monster garage, which got me on the biker build off, which you know, got me on here with you. Yeah. Well, I know well, you've, you've reached the top. <laughs> <laughs> Once you hand me that gold trophy, I'm, I mean, I'm at my races. So, so you bring up a good point then too, as far as learning a lot of this uh, out of necessity, um, you know, obviously when, when we're talking, you know, and, and, and you're telling it, you hit on a lot of the highlights and, and what you were doing well. Um, were there some, some areas where there were, was any struggle um, at all? And, and, and really to your point, learning out of necessity where um, you were like, man, I got to figure this out or, or this is, this is really being a, a, a real difficult, you know, piece of, of this journey. A lot. I mean, on a daily basis, I went through that, you know, I mean, it wasn't all success. It has not been a gravy train by yeah, any Well, way. you made it sound that way. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, that is my true art. Yeah. <laughs> it's about marriage, how easy yeah. that is. Don't, don't um, worry. And if, and if you do mention anything, I can just edit it out because I get to yeah. control all of it at the end anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, um, I had a lot of struggles, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, um, like when I started making parts, I was hand making them because I couldn't, I still didn't have the money to, um, you know, to get the mass produced by somebody else, for example. So I'd hand make, like we'd go out to a bike night. I was making these little oil caps, for example, that looks like the res revolver the cylinder from a revolver pistol with the, with the bullets in it, right? Sure. Like it's a revolver. And they were really cool. Everybody's into guns. It's into motorcycles typically. And um, so people would see it and say, Hey, where'd you get that? And I'd say, I'd make it, you know, give me a hundred bucks and I'll bring you one next Thursday night at bike night. And they would hand me a hundred dollar bill, you know, and that would happen two or three, four times a night. And I'd go home with three or four or $500, you know, and that was how my business really started. That got to a point some point where I was able to get the mass produced out of house and then I would just sell them. And, you know, I, I might make 10 or 20 at a time. I'd pay the machine shop that made them for me. I'd sell them all and I have some profit. I pay my bills. I'd buy a bigger inventory and I literally grew my business, you know, week by week that way. Cause I had no working capital to begin with. Right. Um, and, but, you know, and I learned a lot about, about that, about how much do you reinvest? How much do you keep, you know, how, 
how much of an inventory do you want to hold? How do you control supply and demand? Yeah. Um, and being you know, a finance that. guy, that's where my brain tends to go as far as the business side of it goes, right? Because mm-hmm. my because my next question was going to be, um, was there any kind of product that you saw where you were like, you know what, this is going to take off. This is going to be great. People are going to love it. And then it turned out that it kind of flopped and you're like, wow, I just spent however much money on inventory or whatever. And, and no one actually wants this. <laughs> yeah. I, that happened several times to me, you know, like, and I, and I, and it was a, a great learning experience. Like, you know, I would, so most of the stuff I was making product wise was, you know, 50, a hundred bucks. I could get that out of anybody. But when I went to make something that was maybe 500 bucks, $700, that was really harder to sell it. I didn't, I didn't know that because people would see my bike my bike was really unique. What was happening when I lived in Miami in the, in the nineties, what we were riding, me and my brother were building was so different. It was, my brother's girlfriend was Swedish and she would bring us back these Swedish chopper magazines. And what they were doing in Sweden was nothing like what was happening in the U S and we were kind of building our own version of that stuff. And so people would see our bikes and love them. And they hadn't seen anything like it in a long time. And Oh my God, I love your bike. So I started making this product based on what people were telling me. Then I realized they love it, but they're not going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> they love it. Right. Until it's to go for yeah. walk. That's what you need to figure out. You're like, oh yeah, you like it when other people have it, but you are not willing to pay for it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like grandparents love the grandchildren, but they don't. <laughs> right, they right, right, right. When it's time to put them to sleep, they go, hey, here you go. We're going to head out. You guys got yeah. the kids, right? <laughs> so. And, and I experienced a lot of that, you know, and I made some stuff, but generally speaking, I would, um, you know, what I, I got into building, I had been building custom motorcycles and, and the custom motorcycles was my, my test ground for what I was doing. You know, sometimes I would like, I would make a product that I didn't think would sell, but if I put it on this bike and people like the bike, then they'll buy the product. And that's really how I used the custom motorcycle building to sell the products that I was making. And because I knew if I didn't have to buy an ad in a magazine, like if the bike was on the cover of Easy Rider, people wanted those handlebars. They wanted those exhaust pipes. They wanted that set of grips, those foot pegs. And that was what worked out for me. And I just learned, learned how to make it work in my, in, you know, I, I learned my industry. I learned manufacturing. I learned finance. I learned numbers. And I learned, uh, you know, um, supply line control. And I figured out how to make it work. And, you know, and, I, and it's changed over the years in the motorcycle industry, but I, I figured out that that's the way to make the living to live the way I want to live. Yeah. And, and so bringing up to um, the, the writing that you were doing for the magazines and the technical writing, um, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the how to build old school choppers is, is that kind of what led into the writing of that one because you had had the credentials as far as the technical writing and that, and that kind of thing. And you're like, I can, I can make this into a book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the publisher actually approached me uh, motor books international. They did the chop fiction book, which came first. And then that book, which came second and the chop fiction book sold so well, it was more about my life and my career and how I was influenced and how my business developed. Um, and some of the motorcycles I'd built. Cause I, like a, in a really short window from say 98 to 2002, 2003, uh, well really 2002, it kind of came out of nowhere. You know, I was young and um, I looked different than most of the guys you saw. It was more of an older crowd building those custom bikes. It's kind of except for me and Jesse James were the only two younger guys that really had success at it. Um, and it was a kind of an exclusive club when it came to custom bike builders. You know, they, they knew the magazines, the magazines, magazines knew them. And so it was hard to break into and Jesse and I had done it. Um, so, you know, I, I had a really short window where, you know, I came out of nowhere kind of um, all of a sudden, cause I took it serious. Like I said, you know, before 2006, I mean, I'm sorry, before 96, I was just kind of goofing around and didn't take it seriously. Right. And then, I'm like, okay, I gotta start thinking about, I'm gonna be 30 in four years. You know, I gotta kind of grow up a little bit. I didn't grow up enough, unfortunately, but you know, I-, I <laughs> Well, you, you know, you did, you did all right. You, you, you know, yeah. you, you came into your own. And, and so that actually kind of leads into uh, the Great Biker Build-Off period. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, how did, so how did that show end up coming about? 
Um, I, I know you were one of the mainstays on, on the show. You were, uh, you know, regularly competing against more people, whereas other guys kind of were a little bit more sporadic. You, you definitely yeah. seem to be one of the more mainstays. Yeah. I mean, this is such an interesting story and, and most people don't know the real version of it, but so what, um, I did monster garage and I stayed in contact with those people. They're the people that made, uh, motorcycle mania one and two with Jesse. And then, um, I said, if you guys ever want to do another show about somebody besides Jesse, I'd be interested. And they contacted me and, uh, it was like March of 2002 and said, Hey, we think we're going to make motorcycle mania three with you. And I said, great. And they ended up coming down to my place and in Florida. And, and we kind of started filming for, I think about two days. And then the producer came in one day and said, Hey, we, we just got a phone call from the network where there's a legal issue with us making the show. We're not going to be able to make it. Um, but we want to do something with you. So let's figure it out. So we literally went to the store, bought a 12 pack of beer. We sat down on a couple milk crates and we started kind of brainstorming ideas for what a show would be. And we came up with the concept of biker build off, which is where two different bike builders would compete against each other, build a motorcycle in a month, ride it to a event and have the the people at the event judge the motorcycle and we came up with that concept and and i we sat down and i i gave them a list of guys i thought that would be good because it's mostly a male industry especially back then it was sure so it was, it was all males of guys that i thought would be uh good to be on the show and they had a few names and we figured it out and so we did the first one in um in 2002 with Roger Borget from Arizona, another bike builder from Arizona. And it was an instant success, had amazing ratings for a cable, you know, like 1.3 million people saw it on Discovery, which was huge, it would be huge now, but it was huge back then for, you know, because Discovery Channel at that time, you know, Discovery was mostly, um, you know, more like a history and science channel. right? And then they did Motorcycle Mania, which was a whole different thing. But, you know, they had like the Crocodile Hunter. The Crocodile Hunter was the first dis, uh, cable TV celebrity. And he right. was on, on Discovery. And so this was like a whole new thing for them. They realized this is not what we do, but it's getting us amazing ratings, generating a lot of revenue. And so, you know, obviously I was one of the people that helped create that, you know, through them and through what Jesse brought to me. Yeah. And, and I know too, you brought up that um, the, the crowd at the time was a bit of an older crowd. Mm -hmm. um, that would make me think that some of the folks that you guys would have presented the idea to, you might've gotten a little bit of pushback from just because, you know, they're a little bit older, they're not quite sure about it. Um, did, did you guys have some of that from, from some of the folks that you proposed the idea to? You mean at the network? No, 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 no. Like some of the other chopper uh, builders, like some of the other, the other motorcycle guys. Um, or were they all, were they all on board where they were like, hell yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Everybody was on board. Cause they all saw what happened with Jesse James, you know, Jesse, That's James, true. everybody saw even people who were averse to it, including me, I'm shy. Um, and I, I had to overcome my shyness through doing that out of necessity. But I realized if I have opportunity to do this, if I do this, this could really change my life. And I was correct. If I had gone with my, my instinct, you know, we probably wouldn't be having this, this cover. I'd be changing somebody's oil right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you had had pretty good success throughout your life at that point, kind of going by your instincts, um, you know, and, and to your point too, as far as the timing and, and sometimes you just get lucky and, and that kind of thing. Um, did the, one of the other things too, that I know a lot of people talk about is how, um, you know, show ideas, once suits kind of get involved in that kind of thing, that they kind of tweak it and, and they, they kind of take over creative control and that kind of thing. Um, but the way that you guys were discussing the show, did it, did it play out the way that you guys had originally expected it to, or, 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 or were those some changes where they made some, some adjustments? Um, no, it, it played out the way that we wanted it to, you know, um, the, f the first show I was on, so we didn't have any contracts, you know, they literally didn't, they never sent me a contract and they never paid me to do a TV show. Um, they would literally call me and say, hey, we're going to make a biker build off with you and so and so. And this is when we want to do it. And I would say yes, because um, we I knew it just instinctively it was the right thing to do. But because we had no contracts, 
they couldn't really tell me what to do. You know, they couldn't yeah. say, you know, they weren't paying me for anything. I remember a few times they would say, Hey, can you say this? Or can you say that? Or can you do this? And I said, no, because I'm not an actor. Actors get paid. You guys aren't paying me. Yeah. So no, I'm just going to be genuine and be me. And that was another lesson I learned. It was what worked the best for me. Just be authentic, be yourself, be genuine. And either people will like you or they won't. Right. So if I go back and I watch it and I see you pick up something, you're like, mm, man, I'm really enjoying this nice cold Coca-Cola. That was <laughs> yeah. actually you and not them paying you to, to plug Coca-Cola there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like they, they wanted me to have drama with other people, with girlfriends, all kind of stuff. And that's kind of what I was hinting at where, where that's the part, right. Where they try to spice up the TV and they try to add yeah. some, some things. Um, I know it seemed like a lot of times on, on some of the other um, motorcycle shows and, and chopper shows that were at the time, where, you know, they're, they're out, um, you know, test driving it or whatever. And then the next scene, they're on the side of the road, like, oh my God, this bike needs to be delivered in two days. Is it, yeah. is it, you know, something broken? You know what I mean? They try to, to hype it up a, a little yeah. bit like that. And so I wasn't quite sure if, if there were some, you know, some of that action kind of going on. <laughs> they, they, they didn't really try that that much with, with us. You know, what happened was later on as the, they, you know, got to make eight, 10, 12, 15 episodes of Biker Build Off. It started generating a lot of money. And then that's when the, the network got involved more so, and they started trying to change things. And, and that's kind of when my exit came, you know, my exit was voluntary. And um, I was like, I don't like the way that it's going. They started picking some people that I thought sh didn't have any right being on that show, you know, from being in the motorcycle industry for so long, even at that point, Sure. What, 20 years, you know, um, well, no, yeah, what, 12, 12 years, 15 years, whatever. Um, and I just didn't like a lot of the decisions they were making. So I said, Hey, I, I got what I need to get out of it. I'm, I'm going to make my exit. Yeah. And, and did you find too, that kind of, we were talking about ushering in a new age, um, in terms of the popularity of motorcycles and choppers. Um, I'm assuming at that point you had been going to a lot of these events for, for a long time, you know, Sturgis and, and Bike Week in Daytona. Um, did you guys see the, the crowd shifting um, and also starting to see a lot of younger people um, that were big fans of you because of, of the show and, and things like that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was amazing, you know, the, uh, I mean, it was instantly overnight that happened. And we start going to events and I started getting paid to go to events. You know, they literally say, Hey, we want you to come to Daytona bike. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay me to show up somewhere. How great is that? <laughs> yeah. And I, and, you know, and I, mean, I, I, I literally, you know, at one point from, I say 2002 to 2006, I was gone 40 plus weekends a year at a paid event. Um, and we get there and they pay me to be there. They take me to dinner. They put me in a hotel and, and then on top of it, we'd sell, you know, just boxes and boxes of soft goods, you know, hats and t-shirts and stuff. Sure. And it was really an amazing time to be in that business. And, um, you know, it all came from the TV thing. It was, it was really, really amazing. And I met a lot of great people through it. I met a lot of horrible people through it. And, but I learned a lot of lessons too good and bad. And I mean, it's a really remarkable time. Yeah. Did you, did you hit a point with, with traveling like that where, you know, maybe you get burnt out or something like that. And you're just like, man, I just really want to start turning wrenches again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost. Yeah. It was a, a really hard, I didn't deal with it well on a personal level, but it was a really hard time. I mean, I, it was so, we were making so much money and I was having so much fun. It was hard to stay focused, you know, and I, I had a business at home and as the, the money grew, I had to hire more people. And when you hire people, you, you invite problems. And, you know, so I had a, business running at home you know, I ended up having three revenue streams I was manufacturing the parts we had all the clothing sales and I was getting paid to do really four revenue streams getting paid to do the events and then I was selling custom motorcycles that I was building so I'd usually work Monday through Thursday at the shop I work I bust my butt you know usually work 60 hours in four days you know four 15 hour days try and get some rest fly out Friday morning to wherever I had to be make a boatload of money you know sometimes i'd be in say uh you know chicago on on friday or saturday and and then in boston on sunday and i would you know getting an appearance fee and ha had two trucks running all over the country full of goods we'd be shipping fedexing and upsing boxes of clothing and stuff to sell at the events and it was 
<laughs> it was a wild time, you know? Yeah. And, and, and my guess too, is it's probably somewhere in this period of time. Um, I know, you know, going back to your history where, you know, your first motorcycle, you had to buy in parts because you didn't have the money to buy one. I'm assuming you probably also became a bit of a collector um, at, at some point in time, right. With the money coming in. And that's when you were like, Hey, you know, now I can go and rebuy, you know, my, my 1950 pan head and, and I can start to collect. Um, is that one of the things that you were, you were doing at the time? Cause I know you had, um, a large collection at the, the location in Daytona. Um, mm. is, is, is that kind of when you started, you know, really getting into that? Yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, I, so I was, I had never been married. I was single. I never had any kids. You know, I, was making more money than, you know, I never lived in a, a crazy lifestyle. So I, I didn't, wasn't smart with all the money, but I was smart with a lot of it, you know? So I bought real estate. I bought some antique motorcycles. I thought these are just what I liked and they weren't, um, cons- they weren't desirable at the time, but they became desirable over time. And so I made sure. really good investments in that. And, and um, yeah, you know, I mean, I was, I learned about money, about how, you know, it was easy, it was easy to make, it was hard to keep. And yeah. so, you know, and, and hard to make it work for you, you know, cause it, I was working for a lot of it. And like, how do I make it work for me? Cause my, my thing was, I was, I was getting burnt out. Like you asked a few minutes ago. And so how do I, how do I um, mitigate that? Yeah. And, and keep doing this for another year, another two years, another five years. I, I knew at some point the wheels would come off, <laughs> but how do I, until that, moment comes how do i manage it and i learned a lot about about that about you know what not to give away of myself to other people sure um, and then and then the thing that always grounded me was you know we'd have we'd go to a bike event and it could be an indoor bike show it could be a daytona bike week sturgis whatever we have a line of three or four or five hours of people that because they saw wow. us on tv wanted to shake hands and yeah. i would stand there until the last person was gone, because I always remembered where I came from. I, I remember get, you know, starting with just parts of motorcycles and people would tell me their stories, you know, and, um, and tell me about how they saw me on TV and decided they want to build a Harley or they bought a bike and parts and wanted to build it. And I, you know, on the human level, I was able to connect with each person, which would get me through the next 10 minutes, which would get me through the next hour, which would get me through the next day. Sure. And, uh, and I know, and kind of getting up to speed to, to now, um, you know, with, with three girls um, and you uh, about a couple of years ago, um, moved the shop from Daytona up here to Columbia. Um, what was kind of the, the deciding factor, you know, especially coming from, you know, you had been in Florida pretty much all your life, um, you know, and, and deciding to kind of uproot, um, you know, and, and make the move to, to Tennessee. I mean, I just, you know, I had at, by the age of 40, felt like I'd fully lived, you know, I truly (laughs) felt like I don't need to do anything else in my life. Yeah. I hadn't done was get married to have kids. Yeah. You know? Um, and so, uh, we have our girls and, you know, when we moved here, our, our youngest was a week old, Mm -hmm. maybe two weeks old when we moved into our house here. But we, we wanted to give them a better life, you know, and, and this central Tennessee area is a great area for schools and family and community. And where we were from wasn't as good, you know, I don't want to be disparaging to it, but it, this is a better opportunity for our kids. And so that was, we had friends here. We loved the area. Um, it, being hard from the, away from the ocean is very difficult for me. That's the one thing I struggle with every day because I sure. grew up around the ocean, but I don't, I don't miss Florida that much um, except for that. But it was just, you know, I I've changed, I've changed a lot, you know, and I, I don't need to party and I don't need to get wild and be all over the country. I mean, you know, is it nice to travel? Of course, but I've already done all that. So I've been to Asia and Europe and, you know, I've been everywhere. Yeah. So, um, I've kind of like, well, I'm going to slow down and do what's best for my kids and Sure. They can have the kind of opportunities I've had. Right. Which, which of course, slowdown is always relative, right? Because when you've got three kids who are all under the age of five, um, you know, the, the slowdown is literally now trying to corral three, 
you know, small human beings who really want to do their own thing and you're trying to guide them and do something else. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's just as exhausting, just, you know, in a different way. <laughs> yeah, my, my three girls, when they've skipped a nap and there's loud music on, it's wilder than any strip club I've ever been in. It's wilder <laughs> yeah. than any bar brawl I've ever seen. It's, yeah. it's insane how crazy right. it is. It's probably more exhausting, you know, than any party you had probably ever been to, yes. you know. Yes. <laughs> Um, which, so that's great then. So, um, so as far as the next step, so, um, you know, obviously priorities changed and stuff since you guys had moved up here. Um, you know, you've got the shop now established, you guys are moved in, you know, and all that kind of thing. Um, so what's, so what's next for you and, and for Choppers Inc.? So I'm, I'm just circling back around. I'm, I'm going back into the, I really haven't made parts for quite a few years. I'm going to go back into the parts business, manufacturing in general. I mean, that's, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm 51. My youngest is not even two years old yet. So I got 20 years ahead of me. And this is how I started my business in the first place. I always look at where am I? Where am I going? Um, how do I get from A to Z in the most, you know, the most efficient manner or the least damaging manner to me, you know? Right. Like I'm, I have the energy of a 25 year old right now, but I won't have that in 10 years. I know it. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have it in five years. And that's assuming I stay healthy and I don't get in a motorcycle accident or, you know, something else. So I have to plan for 20 years. So I basically am looking at, okay, how much money do I need to make for the next 20 years? How do I do it? Assuming that I'm going to have stronger first 10 years and then a, maybe a weaker second 10 years as I get older, and don't have the energy or I'm not as relevant. How do I stay relevant? You know, these, those are the things that I ask myself and I look at what's happening. Like there's a lot of guys in my industry now that are 70 years old, late sixties. And I'm looking at them, talking to them, feeling them out and, you know, learning how to evolve and adapt, you know, and out of necessity, I got to take care of these girls, you know, and not only pay for them, but also make sure that I'm present for them as a yeah. father, as a man, Yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's my life now is controlled by what's, how do I best be a dad to my kids? Sure. And so that, so going off of that then, so that's making me think that there will be the, um, the chopper business, um, but then also um, an upcoming kind of parts aspect to it as well. Right. So, so it'll be kind of two, um, two parallels that, that you kind of have running, you know, at the same time. Yeah. And, and then, and, and, you know, choppers I've been, so choppers have been around for a long time, but, I've seen it cycle become popular and become not popular three times as you know, in 30, over 30 years. Sure. So it's starting to come back around again. They've been not popular for the last several years. I mean, people have been riding a whole different type of motorcycle. Yeah. And yeah. A lot society of, changes. Right. And so yeah. people have different mentalities and different mindsets. And, and to your point too, the next time it comes around, it'll probably be different than it was in the two thousands you know, and then it was in the eighties and the nineties and then the seventies. So, so a, a, how we're thinking of a chopper right now might be different than what people are thinking of at five or six or 10 years from now. Yeah. Like my popularity now, I never expected it because, you know, say I was, I did shows on discovery from 2001 to 2006. That's been 15 years since I've yeah. done one. But then see, it's something I couldn't have predicted, but guys who were 15, 15 years ago, are 30 now they're right. watching as a teenager with their dad yeah or with their buddies on discovery channel and now they're out making money they're doing their own thing and they're like you know what i i want to see i'm gonna see what that guy's doing and google me sure and contact me and say hey i'd love to have a custom motorcycle or i want to have you you know work on my bike or i want to buy one of your parts because of that connection from so long ago so i'm i'm, I'm lucky in the sense that again it's my timing that now that that crowd of people is um, a consumer, whereas before they were just a fan. Right. And, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and, and, you know, just knowing you and knowing your history, um, it, it sounds like your, your mind and, and how you are planning on operating and running your business that you, you know, you're not just guessing, right? That you know, hey, this is the best way that, that I'm going to be able to position myself for the future. So yeah. I, have, I have no doubts that you'll be successful. I think it's going to be great. 
Um, so I, I think, I think you'll kill it. Um, well, for the, for the last couple of minutes left, uh, is there, you know, obviously, like I mentioned at the beginning, you guys definitely want to follow, um, follow him on, on Facebook. Um, you know, he posts a lot of, of, of really old school classic videos and pictures and also current stuff. I remember, um, you know, seeing one of the girls that were just dancing and singing, <laughs> dancing and singing in the car, <laughs> you know, which was hilarious. Um, but uh, yeah, so is there, is there anything else you'd, you'd want to go out on here at the end? You know, um, so, you know, I, I appreciate that, that mention, you know, people have um, a really good following on Facebook and Instagram at choppers.inc and Billy on Instagram and Billy Lane of Choppers Inc on Facebook. And, and, I, and I'll put it in the show notes too, so people can yeah. see it. And I've got a YouTube channel and I, and that's one of the things I'm really going to start embracing now um, because I can do my own thing when I want. And um, with that, and I think that's a way to great way to connect to younger people. I mean, I think people my age and older than me aren't that into YouTube too much, but um, I know just with watching how my, my kids are a great tool for me to learn things. Like I see what they're into. They, they don't want to watch a TV program. They want to watch, which is probably an old man's term now. Like TV, <laughs> TV program. <laughs> but, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to call you out on it, <laughs> but, but they want to watch YouTube. You know, they want to watch something for three minutes and then go to something else, you know, right. they watch a music video. Then they want to watch car tires running over, water balloons you know and, <laughs> yeah. and so i'm learning from that and i'm gonna you know embrace youtube i've already started to but do a lot of stuff on there um you know and i like to involve i've always one of the great things about i like to teach so i want to teach younger people how to do what i do and maybe involve younger builders um because you know i think the trend is going toward more of the electronic tech side of things these days and so people who can actually build things with their hands and do things with their hands are always going to be necessary. And sure. Um, so I think it's going to be a shrinking segment of the workforce moving forward, but there's always going to be, be a need for it. So teach people how to do this kind of stuff, maybe engage people, you know, one-on-one -on -one that way. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's great. Well, and, and like I said, I'll include all the links in the show notes too. And so that way people will see the Facebook and the Instagram and the YouTube channel. And I wasn't even aware of the YouTube channel. So I know I'm going to subscribe. Um, you know, whenever, whenever we get done. Um, but no, it was, it was great. I, I, you know, there were some things I know we've talked about before that, that I already knew, but, but I also learned a ton. And, and so I always appreciate the, uh, the knowledge and, and, and the expertise. And, and even for me, just being a finance person and you being such a successful entrepreneur, you know, being able to pick out and understand, um, you know, those nuances when it comes to operating and running a business is, is always learning. So, um, so I super appreciate it. I know we'll stay in contact and, and I wish you all the best. I do. Same to you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sarah.